As you can see, there's like woods everywhere. You just can't help but have your eye drawn into the woods. I remember thinking, she's out there somewhere. How deep would you go into these woods? Well, it was never ending. You just kept going because you have a job to do. What is going through your head when you're walking through these woods? That today is the day I'm going to find my daughter. Every time I came out here, I would talk to God and say, please let me find her. Let me find something. What a cute shop. I don't know how I fit this in my bag to take home, but I know a four-year-old little girl at home that would be real into this guy. We are in Snow Hill, Maryland, which is a really small town. It's only like 2,000 people. It was founded in the late 1600s. So Snow Hill predates America. It's a thriving community. There's mom and pop shops everywhere, and people are really, really proud to come from here. We're in Snow Hill, Maryland, the cutest little, little town on the Eastern Shore. I mean, it's so little, you cannot leave the house without running into somebody or five that you know. We have a great community. We go way back, a lot of history here. I was from here, my father's from here, his father was from here. You all work together, you go to church together, it's just, you feel very safe. <laughs> like, I don't, per se, lock my doors. So when a young woman showed up missing, it scared me because that's not what this neighborhood is. In 2007, a young mother from Delaware, Christine Shetty, came down to this area, and then she went missing. She completely vanished, and no one knew what happened to her. Christine had a really good sense of humor. She was outgoing. She was just adventurous. And when Christine became a mom, she wanted to be the best mom she could ever be. She became everything to her kids that I wish I could have been to her. I'm Lynn Dodenhoff, and I am Christine Shetty's mother. When Christine was little, I sure wasn't doing a great job. My drinking was getting in the way. And I was in a couple of abusive relationships, and, and she saw a lot of, you know, the bad in me. You know, that, that bothers me a lot. Christine came from young parents. Both of our parents were alcoholics. Um, that's something we both struggled with. Me and Christine, we were best friends. We did the outlandish stuff, got in trouble. We weren't the, the teenage girls of getting your nails done and going to the mall. That was not us. Christine was so full of life. Uh, she was a goofball. We got in trouble with drinking, partying. We were the cool ones in school. In high school, Christine started dating Jimbo. They really hit it off. Christine was 19, and she got pregnant with Haley. And when Haley was born, Christine bloomed. She blossomed. She became a grown-up. But Jimbo had cancer, and ultimately he passed. Christine was really devastated after she lost Jimbo. Me and Stephen, we had gotten married. We decided we were going to stop drinking. We offered to adopt Haley because Christine didn't have the means to look after her. Christine was lost for a while. Then she met this guy named Levi. I didn't know him too well, but she said Levi was nice to her in the beginning. Levi swooned her. He treated her like a queen. With him, she had two boys. You know, now she's got three kids. But Levi wasn't a family man. He loved those boys, but he didn't provide for them. Steve and I bought the boys formula, diapers, food because he wouldn't do it. He was into drugs. So Christine was living with Lynn, along with Haley and the two boys. It was close quarters. 
but we were doing pretty good. Steve and I were working. We had our own business. Christine would help with the office work. But when you have two women, like-minded women, in the same house, you tend to butt heads. Milk was like $3 and something a gallon. And the little one would drink like a gallon a day. Okay, so I just asked her, I said, can you please, like, maybe not give him so much milk, you know, give him something else to drink. Well, that went into a full-fledged fight, you know, and um, uh, she pushed me, I pushed her. I said some things, and she said some things, and... Then she called her friend and said, you know, I need to get a ride. I'm not staying here anymore. Christine had some friends in Pocomoke, Maryland. That was Tia and Junior. Tia and Junior were a couple, but Tia had two children. Christine and Tia hit it off pretty good, you know, because they had a lot in common. Christine and Tia did bond because they were single moms. They both had a rough life. Tia told her that she can come down and take the boys and come stay as long as she wants. Christine only took a couple of backpacks with the kids' clothes for like a weekend or whatever, clear her head. And a couple weeks later, I got a phone call saying that Christine was gone. But the boys were there, like by themselves. And nothing was adding up to me because I knew she would never leave without her kids. And that's when I filed my missing person report. In 2007, I was a detective with the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. Christine was last seen at a farm in Pocomoke, Maryland, which is the southern end of Worcester County, where she was staying with some friends. A uniformed deputy was dispatched to the farm to take an initial missing person report. The farm was in a very remote rural area of the county. Upon the deputy's arrival, he was met by the uh, residents of the farmhouse, and they told the deputy Christine and her children had been staying with them for several weeks, and that on the day of Christine's disappearance, they had left the property to go shopping, and when they returned, Christine was gone, and they had found Christine's young children alone at the house. We're just right over the Maryland border into Delaware. This is where Christine grew up. It is where her mother, Lynn, now lives on her horse farm. I feel deeply for Lynn. I don't know what I would do if my child were missing. I'm gonna go visit her and learn more about her daughter and about how this case unfolded. We're going to hug. Look at this place. Would you like to see that? Yeah, I would love that. Okay, let me get a coat. Yeah, watch out. There's water. Yeah. It's nothing special. Oh, stop. In here. This is great. This is Puzzle. That's Mia. Hey, Mama. And then there's Donald. Hi. You spend a lot of time out here. I do. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it keeps you sane. You can talk to them and they don't roll their eyes and there's no judgment is there, baby. They know when you're hurting and they just let me know it's okay. They have been and always will be part of my healing process. It's an ongoing thing. Christine? She's a beautiful girl. Oh my God, she's stunning. Yeah. Wish I could have done better by her. I want a good mom. Yeah, it's hard. And you had kids really young, right? Mm -hmm. I got pregnant when I was 16 with my first. Well, you were still a kid at that point. Yeah, I was. I was. A kid with a kid. Right. Yeah. After you get the phone call that Christine is missing, investigators go out and check out the farm. 
They walked around. They couldn't see anything of Christine. The police did interview Tia and Junior. Tia and Junior told the deputy that she had uh, departed the farm and they had no idea where she was. Uh, as they were looking around, they found an empty vodka bottle. They found a jar of change that was missing and they found a note left by Christine saying that she was leaving. So this is the letter that Christine left. I want to thank you too for allowing my children and I to come stay with you and your family. The note was left. Money's gone, alcohol is gone. So there were things that looked like she left under her own free will. Yes. We learned that neighbors to this farm had trail cameras set up. The cameras were able to show Tia and Junior leaving the property and then coming back. The camera footage did not show anyone else coming or going, be it another vehicle or Christine. So they had a timeline of when the cars were coming and going. And did that back up Junior and Tia's story? Yes. Even though the farm is in an isolated area, it's only a few miles to an interstate. The camera was focused on a driveway, so it was entirely possible that Christine had walked around the camera out onto the road. She could have gone anywhere. When Christine went missing, my first suspicion was Levi was involved with my daughter Christine's disappearance. If you stepped out of line of what Levi wanted or Levi thought was okay, then it was holy hell. Christine would deal with the screaming matches, the fighting. With Levi, it was tumultuous. All, all the time. And uh, the last time she came home, she had black eyes. Levi had told Christine if she ever left with the kids, he would kill her. There were criminal charges filed against Levi that I saw mm -hmm. in police records. Well, I had him in court three or four times, I think. Levi was definitely a suspect in her disappearance. So Levi was questioned. He said he was at work during the time of Christine's disappearance. And he provided the detective with information that uh, kind of uh, opened the door to other possibilities that Christine may have just voluntarily walked off. He had retrieved, along with her two children, certain personal items of Christine's from the farm. There was a uh, spiral-bound notebook that Christine had been using as a personal journal. Within the journal, there was poetry, notes, random thoughts. Uh, there was also a page of listing different support agencies, as well as numbers for adoption agencies. That certainly is a little peculiar. We submitted a journal entry by Christine Shetty, as well as the letter that she had left at the farmhouse to a, a statement examiner, and uh, he produced the following report. The writing is self-absorbed, and Miss Shetty's poetry indicates that she's frustrated with her life. The word embrace is a term of welcome and desire. I think this is about losing the life she has presently and a desire for the unknown or something new. That would support the idea that she left voluntarily. So police form their opinion about Christine's state of mind based on these journals. Did investigators ever come up and do an interview with you to learn more about your daughter? No. Nothing? Nothing. Mm -mm. I was always calling. If I heard anything, I would call and relay it to the detectives. And they would get back with me. Yeah. Okay, but then it was kind of a little low, and I was wondering, you know, hey, I need somebody to, you know, call me. So I called down, and I got the supervisor, Mike McDermott, mm -hmm. and I said, well, you know, I would like to be kept in the loop a little more. And, and he said, let me explain something to you. Your daughter was a sponge on society because of her lack of work history, and she simply disappeared on a drunken drug binge. Oh, oh God. How do you say that to someone who 
has a missing child. I just couldn't believe what I had heard. And then a couple of days after I spoke with Mike, I got this. District Court of Maryland for Worcester County, arrest warrant for desertion of a minor child against Christine Marie Shetty. It's kind of a slap in the face. This here just made me fight harder. I became interested in the case shortly after it began through discussion with other detectives. We all knew each other, small town, uh, local police departments, we all talked. But at that point in time, it wasn't my responsibility to investigate it. The supervisor of the case, Mike McDermott, he was convinced that Christine had just ran off um, and left her children. You know, there were detectives under him that were good detectives. But when your supervisor's controlling um, the resources that you have and the direction that you're going, basically forced these detectives to go down the path to prove his theory correct. Is there any forward momentum? Is anybody making any strides in the case? I called local TV stations. I asked them if they could put my daughter's picture on TV. Christine Shetty was last seen on November 3rd. We made up flyers and we distributed it to Maryland and back. It would be very fair to say uh, in this area that the rumor mill is a central part of uh, how information is transferred between people. There were literally hundreds of tips that were called or emailed into us. We had store clerks calling in, bus drivers, distant associates, people that had gone to high school with her. There were some tips and stuff coming in. Nothing came of it, but I did my own investigation. I met Tia and Junior's neighbor. She's a very sweet woman. She said, Lynn, you do realize there's another guy living in that house. Wait, what? Yes, there was another guy living in the house. I know. Were police aware of him? Not until I told them. They had no idea. No. The neighbor told me Justin was Tia's cousin. When the police came, uh -huh. he would disappear. He would hide or whatever, he, you know. And Tia and Junior never said anything about him. So it looks like Tia and Junior have been covering for this kid. Well, nobody said, you know, Justin's here. Hey, you want to talk to Justin? Nobody said that. Mm -hmm. When I found out, I called Detective Kagan and I told him, and I said, there's another guy living there. He goes, no, there's not. And I said, yes, you need to go out there. No one had mentioned that this person had even existed. By the time we learned that Justin had indeed been staying at the residence, he had left the state and moved to Texas with his father. That immediately raised red flags. We went back to the farm. There were multiple searches done. We used cadaver dogs. We did grid searches. We were looking for any signs of Christine, signs of unusual activity on the property. One day, I called down and they said, oh, they're out at the property doing a search. So I brought a toothbrush and a hairbrush with, you know, Christine's DNA for a DNA sample. So I went down there. And they had the Maryland State helicopter out there and cadaver dogs. So I walked up with the toothbrush and hairbrush and I handed it off to the police. Okay. And I remember hearing one dog bark, but then nothing, you know, came of it. Detective Kagan was active, but the supervisor, Mike McDermott, he didn't want this investigation. I think it was easier for him to say, I did everything that I could. We did searches, we did this, we did that, and I had a warrant issued for her arrest. And as a result of that, interest starts to, 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 to move on. The case starts to grow cold. I was sitting here going, okay, what can I do? Yeah. And then a friend of mine called me up and he said, Lynn, there's a blog called the Pokemon Tattler. You need to get hold of Stephanie. I didn't know what a blog was, but I got in contact with Stephanie Burke. Lynn reached out. She sounded really nice and articulate and a very concerned mom. And she told me all of this that had happened to her daughter. 
I said yes. I said, you know, we're a local blog and we talk about things that happen with and around Pocomoke City. Absolutely. I'm going to put this on the front page. Come to find out, her and her husband were friends with Mike McDermott and his wife. Oh, interesting. Yes, the supervisor. I knew Mike McDermott personally uh, from church. And I called him and asked him what the deal was. And his first response to me was, Stephanie, you would never associate with those people. And I was flabbergasted. And I said, why would you say that? And he said, they're bad news. <laughs> it was just unbelievable to me that I could know, but know somebody that could be so callous to express these things about this family that he had no clue about. So I told Lynn, you let me know anything you find out and I'm gonna publish it for you. And in a small area like that, I got the word out really quickly. And as soon as we'd, we'd post something, there would be replies. We were just alerting the community. If somebody does something, usually somebody knows something. We started digging. So I guess that makes me an internet sleuth, but I didn't know that then. <laughs> I was reaching out to everybody. At the time, it was MySpace. I pretty much taught myself how to do it. It's just you have to network. It was pretty simple. You hear a name, say Tia Johnson, and I'd go to her page. And you check out their friends, and then you hit their friends up, and they would tell me stuff. It was incredible. People started pointing fingers at Tiana Jr. very quickly. They had been in a lot of trouble. There was none of that running away stuff that Tia and Junior and them were talking about. It was a lot of dark stuff on there. What was that feeling the first time someone wrote you back? It was great. I was getting information. Yeah. You know, and as I got information, I would send it to the police. Do you feel like the more active you got, were they receptive to it, or did they start to shut down on you? They didn't like me doing their job, but I wasn't going to stop. As time went on, I was just racking my brain, trying to figure out where she was and what had happened. The farm is on 68 acres, and it's just woodland. Some places were wet, you know, and, and dense. I had to have been out there, God, countless amounts of time, just searching on my own. Snowing, raining, hot. You're going past these woods and you look in the woods thinking, could she be there? I couldn't imagine. Standing up to these forces that she was up against, she just kept moving. Lesser women would have given up a long time ago. When Christine went missing, we lost the house, the business, everything, because I couldn't help my husband. He said, Lynn, I need your help, you know, because he was falling behind. I said, I can't help you. And I could not help him because I knew I had to find my daughter. That's hard. How did you find the strength to keep going? Well, Christine had an older brother. That was Michael. He was just a sweet, sweet boy. One day, when he graduated school, he went to a party, and all of a sudden a big fight spilled out of the house, and he come around, you know, the building, and somebody pointed at him, and he said, that's the guy that hit Dawn. He wasn't even in there. So they piled on him and beat him to death. I'm so sorry, Lynn. Eventually, the police had four arrested. There were six altogether, but they didn't have enough evidence to prosecute the other two and the prosecuting attorney he said we got four what more do you want and I remember not saying a word and it ate at me for years so when Christine went missing I promised I would not not say anything anymore There were skeletal remains of a petite woman that was found in Westminster. 
So I called my cops yeah. and told them about it because I had given them the toothbrush and stuff. So the DNA should have been on file. But something told me to go one step further. So what I did is I got the number of the officer in charge of that case and I called her. I told her who I was. She said, I don't want to point any fingers at another police agency that there is no DNA for your daughter on file. They never turned it in. It wasn't Christine, but it's just such a betrayal of trust. During the time, it just didn't seem that anything was happening. With the Tadler blog, we covered the story for a little over two years. Then I called Lynn and told her that she needed to speak to, with Sean Sarver. He had helped me with a special investigation over election fraud. And I saw in him an honesty and integrity that I hadn't seen with the local law enforcement that I had talked to and thought if anybody could help with Lynn's case, he could. We're heading into town here to meet with Sean Sarver, who was an investigator for the state's attorney. He heard Lynn's story and got involved. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing his take on this investigation from law enforcement's perspective. Sean, hi. Oh, hi, how are you, Hillary? It is so nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Was there any time that you took to decide whether you were going to get involved, or it was pretty quick? Oh, it was quick. When Lynn discovered um, that DNA had not been entered for her daughter's case. So they absolutely lied to her? Absolutely lied. <sighs> They claim they lost it. So as part of your special investigator powers, you, you can take over an investigation from a police department um, if you believe that there's malfeasance or anything going on in the case. So that's what I did. I went up to the Worcester County Bureau of Investigation and grabbed the file and took it to the office and home and started looking through it. What are the first things that pop out to you? There was some tips mm -hmm. that were called in that weren't followed up on. Really? But there were gaps in it and pieces of information that could have been followed up on that weren't. And most of it was supplied by Lynn. What was the reaction to Lynn? I think that they had developed a, um, a dislike, you know, for Lynn because she was hounding them mm -hmm. and forcing them to work. And, you know, they would ignore her calls. What was the working theory at the time? The working theory at the time um, was basically that Christine probably just ran away. Once you were able to pour through all of those files, what did your gut tell you had happened? She was murdered. I was online, and something came in. I had somebody get in touch with me and say, Lynn, you've got to get on this one. It's called Tennessee Topics. It's a blog in Tennessee. She said, there's somebody down there talking about Junior. I'm looking at this thread, and this one girl saying, well, I know Junior, you know, you know, he's a really nice guy. Her name was Kim. I got on there, and I told her who I was. I said, I just want you to be really careful. And I gave her my number. And one day, I'm going down the road. I get a phone call from Kim. I pull over, and she says, I just want to let you know that I have a letter from Junior telling her to get in touch with me. Junior was in Tennessee and was arrested for arson. He was looking at a lot of time. So the only bargaining chip he could find was through Kim to get in touch with me. He said if I get him out of Tennessee and back to Maryland, he would give me what I've been looking for for over two years. Once you're in charge of the investigation, what kind of information was Lynn bringing you? She was networking. Um, a lot on social media and she was keeping herself in touch with key players. The big break in the case comes when Lynn receives a letter from Junior. So what does this letter say? Write me back ASAP on this one, okay? With a question mark, please, exclamation. He said, tell her I said to get me out of here and bring to Maryland and I will give her what she wants. In all caps, I didn't do it. I mean, this is a 
just a bomb. This is just a detective's dream. Yeah. Um, and of course, you get information like that and you have to act really fast. I flew out to Tennessee with some other detectives and the state's attorney to speak with Junior and to find out what exactly he knew about Christine. My name is Mike Farlow. I'm an assistant state's attorney in Worcester County, Maryland, here in Snow Hill. When the investigators get into the jail cell, one of the first things that Junior says is, look, I didn't kill Christine, but I know where she's buried and I know who did it. The state's attorney, Joel Todd, and Junior's lawyer enter into an agreement where if Junior gave information to the state regarding the location of Christine, what had actually happened, agree to testify, and most importantly, pass a polygraph test to be able to verify the information, then he wouldn't be prosecuted for any of the murder charges. I remember the state's attorney called me. He said, he's willing to tell us where Christine is. Do you know how awesome that was? At that point in time, with the agreement negotiated, Junior goes ahead and he starts telling the story. Junior tells the investigators that Justin and Christine had had a brief relationship uh, while the two of them had been living there. This day, he and Justin and Christine all had a party behind the house. They had started drinking, that uh, they had started wrestling around some, uh, and then there was an argument that had occurred that Justin had pushed her to the ground, and Christine got very upset, according to Junior, and she ran off into the woods. Junior says he followed Christine, and as he described it, they began having consensual sex uh, in the woods. Junior went on to tell us that uh, while this was occurring, uh, Justin walked up, saw what was going on, and began yelling at Christine. Junior said that he didn't want to get involved in a uh, domestic disturbance between the two, and he started walking away. Uh, he said that he saw that Justin was holding a shovel. When he left the area and went back up to the house, he describes hearing multiple thuds, almost like a bat hitting a softball. And a few minutes later, he went back into the woods. He discovered that Christine was dead, beaten to death, and Justin was standing near the body. Junior went on to tell us that Tia ended up arriving back at the farm soon thereafter, and later that evening when it got dark, he and Justin took Tia's car and they brought Christine's body and they put her into the back of the trunk. And they ended up looting Tia's children into the car. Tia, Junior, and Justin, with Christine in the trunk, drove to Snow Hill. They decide that they're going to drive her to a place called the River House Inn that Junior and Tia both used to work at because they knew that it was closed for construction. They knew that there wouldn't be anybody around. And according to Junior, Tia and the kids go right to sleep after they break into a guest cottage. And that's when he and Justin go down to bury the body right next to the guest cottage. Junior is going to end up going free for this, but he's going to help us get the guy that we believe did it, who is Justin Hadel. But then his story starts changing a little bit. Uh, it's no longer just that he had consensual sex with Christine. All of a sudden, he's telling investigators that when Justin sees them, uh, that they start having a threesome. Once they take Junior's statement after this interview, as an investigator, when you hear these details that are offered up, what does that look like to you? I'm asking if you believe them. Because the deal Junior signed was that if he lies about anything... Correct. He can be sent back to Tennessee, or he could be tried for other crimes here. Correct. Do you think it was consensual sex? I don't. I, I don't know. I mean, for me, <laughs> it feels like they raped her. You know, this whole story of play fighting and sleeping with both of them... Right. Yep. ...is far-fetched to me. Yeah. I, I mean, and again, it's... it's uh, it's covering his, covering her tracks. Come up with some sort of an excuse that if she's found, if the DNA is located there, then, you know, this explains it. Yeah. 
ultimately, um, he convinced investigators that he had accurate information uh-huh. um, of where her body would be found, um, and then uh, he drew them a map. He drew you a map? Yes. Yep. Do you recognize this place? Yes. Yeah, it's uh, the River House Inn, actually located in Snow Hill. They walked around comparing the map that Junior had drawn with the River House Inn property and got ready to start digging and excavating to see if Junior is telling the truth. This is the River House Inn, bed and breakfast, the location that was depicted on the map that Junior drew. And interesting side note, the red building over here is the courthouse, uh, which housed my office and the state's attorney's office at the time. And the sheriff's department is actually in the rear of that building. So we had direct view. You throw a rock. Go throw a rock. That's insane. Junior says, this is where I've put Christine. It's at the rear of the property. Take a walk. Behind the main building, the last house on the left. This is where he identified where the body would be located. And he puts an X there, right here, is is where we start digging. Once we were able to locate the area, we believed uh, Christine's body was, was buried. We had forensic investigators that came in and started a excavation. So I said, well, I want to be down there. We asked Lynn to stay in a hotel nearby. Uh, and she had a direct phone line to the state's attorney, myself, and, and other detectives. Forensic digs are very slow, very tedious. You're scraping off inches of layers of soil and running them through a, through a sieve. So as investigators are digging, digging, and the sun is starting to set, and it's already a cold day, but it's getting colder, and everybody is wondering, are we going to find her or not? And I think there was a point there where everybody was starting to wonder if we had been lied to her. But the dig team uh, continued to dig. And then we heard somebody say they got something. And uh, when we came over, I could see a tennis shoe down at the bottom. uh, And you could tell that there was obviously human remains um, still inside the shoe. I I couldn't even tell you how many times I've driven past this. You know, she was here all along. It feels so arrogant. Right and audacious. I can still see the courthouse from here. Yep. And what's really frustrating is that no one would have ever figured it out if it hadn't been for Lynn. I remember they all came in. They said, we found her shoe. Said they knew they, that they had her. Two years, three months, and seven days of fighting came to an end that day. I just wanted my daughter back, and I got her back. I believe Christine would have gone on to do great things. There's not a day that goes by I don't think about her. Christine was one that always helped others, even though she didn't have it herself. She could make a bad day, turn around quick. Finally... Lynn gets some finality. And the state's attorney's office was able to be Lynn's voice in front of a jury. Justin ended up pleading guilty to first-degree murder, got a life sentence, but all but 30 years suspended. Junior had given information where Christine was located, but Junior failed the polygraph test. At that point, it was clear that he was involved in the murder itself. He ended up pleading guilty also to first-degree murder and got life but 30 years suspended. Tia's initial story was that she didn't know that Christine was in the car. She didn't know she was dead. But ultimately, Tia was sentenced to five years uh, on accessory after the fact and 10 years on burglary. The only reason that she only got five years on the accessory after the fact is because that was the maximum allowed by law at the time. Tia got more time for the breaking and entering than the accessory after the fact. It made me feel something had to change. Just like Lynn fought to get Christine's killers convicted, she fought tooth and nail to get the legislature to change that law to increase the maximum penalty. I was really 
really proud when I stood in line and got behind the governor of Maryland as he signed the Shetty Bennett Act. My daughter's name lives on. We can all learn some lessons from Lynn about tenacity and about just never giving up. You know, if Lynn Dodenhoff came from a well-to-do family, you know, if she lived in one of these mansions in town, I don't think she would have been dismissed as easily. What is remarkable about Lynn is that even when she was proven correct, she didn't try to burn anyone down. She got active, and she started getting laws passed so that no other families would have to deal with the same set of circumstances that she dealt with. And that ripple effect really matters. Lynn Dodenhoff has been able to protect other people from the same fate that she and Christine experienced. <laughs>